Tell us, uh, how long have you been in Baghdad and what kind of things, what has impressed you most in the uh, two years that you've been over there? I've been um, going in and out of Iraq for about two and a half years now. Um, I've been based there permanently for 11 months. Um, when you talk about impressed, I guess the impressions I've had in the past two years is just the sectarian situation and how bad it has become over the past two years. Every time I've gone back, whether it's after four months or two weeks, the sectarian tension has escalated. There are less places one sect can go. Um, you know, the Sunnis are just less and less in Baghdad being pushed out to Enbar. The Shias are being, you know, taking over the capital or staying in their areas will never go to say, Sunni enclaves. And you can really feel that tension every single time you go back. Well, I think it's both the political, it's the political situation, it's a power grab. Everybody's looking out for their interests at this point. And uh, when you look at federalism, for example, which is a hotly debated issue right now and has been for a long time, it's based on a sectarian and ethnic divide. You have the Kurds in the north um, pretty much with a pseudo-independent nation already striking oil deals. You have the Shias in the south vying for power amongst themselves, and you have the Sunnis in the middle trying to sort of get back the power of the old days. And, and it's become an secta extremely sectarian situation. Well, that happened obviously after I'd left, um, but I think uh, the Prime Minister came out saying it was dividing the nation, I believe, but this is, a, this is a policy that's been around since I started two and a half years ago. It's something that's been debated since I, since I went to Basra in August 2005 where they said, yes, finally, we can control the oil down here. We can control our situation. It's something that the Shia and Kurds have wanted. It's a tricky, it's really a tricky thing to judge, to be honest. I don't think it's really just a numbers game. You have to, you have to look at what Iraq looks like. You know, um, I've talked to military officials who've told me, yes, the violence is down, the sectarian violence is down, but is that because there's less sectarian violence or there's less people to kill? Um, that's when you look at the capital, in some American estimates, it went from 65% Sunni pre-invasion to 75% Shia. That's a huge change. And so many neighborhoods have been cleansed and Sunnis are relegated to a few small enclaves of the capital. So when you look at Baghdad that way, Enbar also is an interesting situation because you have the U.S. military, military f striking deals with the tribes out there. So they're fighting Al-Qaeda, but it's a one-sect province. It's Sunni. And now, um, basically, many of the residents talk about the police brutality. That right now, if you speak against the police in Enbar, you can be detained and tortured. If you are suspected of any connection whatsoever to extremism or Al-Qaeda, you are killed. And that's the situation in Enbar right now. I actually just drove through it for the first time. I think we're the first, I'm the first reporter to do that in, God, I think maybe two years, more. Well, I think the point, I, uh, our story's coming out tomorrow, but the, the point was to, to try to do it as a civilian, to try to look at it without the U.S. military, to go to Enbar and say, okay, this is your success story, let's try to drive through it. We made it. You know, I don't know if I was lucky or not, but as I went through with one of our Iraqi reporters from Fallujah, he was pointing out um, different things that sort of showed, progress, showed some of the progress that had happened there. Uh, again, this is in the context of the two point, you know, more than two million people displaced, many of the Sunnis moving to Anbar because they can't go anywhere else. Um, but we are on a highway that lots of civilians were on, civilians leaving the country, obviously. You saw them in their GMC Suburbans, all their belongings, getting, trying to leave. But they took a turn towards Syria because Jordan doesn't let you in anymore as an Iraqi. Um, you saw the concrete barriers that used to be in the middle of the old road, which is the sort of parallel road to the highway, which no one would take uh, maybe five months ago. Those were in the middle of, of the road. Now they're all pushed off to the side, and the, the gangsters or the thugs that would steal from you on that road weren't anywhere that I saw. We picked an opportune time, of course. Yes, uh, that was really sort of the point of our... I mean, the story is coming out tomorrow that I wrote off the trip. Um, uh, should be in our papers tomorrow. The, the reason we did it is that... Um, I wanted to go actually talk to the brother of Abdul Sitar Barisha, 
Uh, there's the, something called the Awakening Council in Enbar, which I'm sure many people have heard of, which is the uh, tribal council that turned against Al-Qaeda in that region. Um, mostly really a spontaneous thing, very pre-surge back in September of 2006. And I thought, you know, why don't I try to make it up there on my own? Maybe I'll ask him for an escort. But I decided if we tried to drive as a family and just see that Iraqi experience, what do you get treated like at the Jordanian border? Um, there was uh, me and then, of course, our Iraqi reporter who acted as my translator, our, our reporter, our translators act as both reporters and translators, and a driver. And we had a second car with us um, acting as a chase car. No, we were not armed. Um, I think he was asking me about uh, suffering people. I think that's the key element of the Iraq coverage. Um, there is the investigative reporting that is extremely important, but a lot of people forget about all these Iraqis stuck in the middle of this war with two to, two to four hours of electricity a day, four years into this war, their children are, this is in the capital, the children are getting extremely sick. Um, I have a, an Iraqi friend whose daughter regularly has very bad dysentery, high fevers because of the water and the lack of electricity. She's two years old. I also, you know, I have another friend who can never push her, hasn't pushed her daughter down the street in a stroller. And she's had that daughter for three years now. Um, people, the Blackwater situation, the Blackwater was heart wrenching. That situation, talking to the victims, talking to a girl who was in her mother's arms when her mother was shot in the head and the chest. I mean, these people are going to a passport office and never make it home. They're, they're going to work and maybe never making it home. They always talk about saying the Shahada, the Islamic creed, before they leave because they know this might be my last day. Um, one thing I just want to make clear is that um, Al-Qaeda really wasn't a power to be reckoned with in Iraq until after the 2003 invasion. It wasn't something that Iraqis feared. It wasn't something that that really happened in Iraq. Saddam was a brutal dictator and he was known as an egalitarian killer. I mean a lot of people think about a Sunni Arab dictator. He he was a man known if you cross him you will die and that's what happened. You know the Shia rose up and they were killed. The Kurds tried to have an independent state and they were it was a genocide up there. Um, and uh, so a lot of times people talk about the Taliban and Al-Qaeda when that wasn't that didn't really exist in Iraq. I mean, Saddam was a, uh, you know, he's a secular dictator, an enemy of Osama bin Laden, not somebody, somebody that uh, Osama bin Laden considered a heretic. And so that's a, that's a lot of confusion, I think, about Iraq when people, because of the continued talk about Al-Qaeda, which is now a, a major element. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I don't think anybody ever wants a foreign um, army on their streets, a foreign military driving up and down their roads, their neighborhoods. Um, but it's an interesting situation because there is a lot of fear of the other now in Iraq and the, and the enemy has shifted in some ways for Iraqis. Um, I think that, you know, I've gone to some Shia neighborhoods or, or, or mixed neighborhoods, I should say, that are in the process of being cleansed of, you know, the Mahdi army, which is the, um, uh, the large Shia militia that's loyal to um, the Shia cleric Muqtada Sadr from the Sutter family, which is, you know, actually a, a, a fractured type of militia. It controls neighborhood by neighborhood in the capital and neighborhood by neighborhood down south, that type of thing, and they're, and they're fighting with other Shia militias. But they're killing, uh, according to residents and people in these neighborhoods, they're killing Sunnis and they're killing Shias that disagree with them. And so people would tell me, you know, we run out to the grocery store when there are American tanks in the street and then we run back home and don't leave again. And so there's a lot of fear of the other and a, and a fear, and that's sort of grown larger than the fear of, of the Americans in some cases. And that's very new, I think, in the last year. No, <laughs> I really don't. I, uh, I consider myself a foreign correspondent, really. I, I, it happens to be in, in a couple wars, but I think all stories are about people. Um, I think the Middle East, in general, is an extremely fascinating region. And although I happen to do it in war, Iraq is a, is a very interesting situation. It's not like I'm driving around in, from car bomb to car bomb. Or I'm trying to avoid those. I'm, I'm quite scared of those types of things. It's, it's a story about people, and I try to always think of it that way. To be honest, by the time I started coming to Iraq, it was too difficult and too dangerous to do that. We'd either do a few hours after, next day, or not even go. Because it's just, you know, it's another roadside bomb. There may be a secondary bombing that will kill one of us and our staff. Well, I don't think it's my area of expertise, really. Well, you definitely see 
an Iranian presence in the South, extremely. You definitely see that. At, you know, my trip to Najaf, my last trip to Najaf was, um, which is an extremely holy city for the Shias in the South, was I think in May. I, we did a drive down there. And you go to the old city, and it, I don't think I heard any Arabic. It was all Farsi in the old city. But, you know, part of that is that there's a pilgrimage. I mean, this is a pilgrimage for the Shias. It's very important to go to the shrine of the Imam Ali. But um, in the capital, you'll see the Iranian ambassador going in and out of these politicians' offices all the time. I see him coming in and out. And they have an extreme interest in Iraq. And Iraq now is the government's a natural ally for Iran. Um, actually, yes, the Ba'ath Party was both Sunnis and Shias. It was not a Sunni-dominated uh, party. And um, so sometimes there's a confusion that when you talk about Saddam Hussein, a Sunni Arab man, that means his followers were still all Sunni Arab. Some of his closest and top aides were Shia. And um, it's also important to note, it's a, an interesting point he made about rehabilitation. Uh, one of the criticisms of the Prime Minister, Nouriel Maliki, who, had, who in the past was on the debathification committee, was that um, you know close colleagues of his and friends on that committee told me that when he looked at a, at a Sunni Arab former Ba'athist, he felt that he was a Ba'athist. He, he was an oppressor of the Shias, and it came from his heart. And when he looked at a Shia Ba'athist, he thought, this man must have been forced into the party. This man, you know, I'm sure he was forced into the party. And so there was this sort of sense, according to people close to Maliki, that, um, that Shias had been forced to be Ba'athist. You know, they would never be Ba'athist because he had been oppressed by the Ba'athists. He had been part of the opposition and he couldn't see. And so that was one of the concerns of him coming into the, into the forefront, was that he was seen as an, an extreme Shia uh, and to, you know, extreme Shia person and a debathifier to the core. And I think in some ways he's changed. I, and, uh, you know, I, I interviewed him maybe a month ago, and he's really in the hot seat right now. And it's, it's interesting because in some ways he really has no power, nothing. I mean, he, he has a parliament that can't agree on anything because of the sectarian and ethnic divide among the parties. He has a government that's falling apart, and he has ministers that are really pushed upon him by the parties. And so it's interesting that he's become the scapegoat of everything wrong in Iraq when he really doesn't have any power to do anything, even kick black water out of his country. Well, um, you know, that's something that I obviously it's more coming out of Washington, that those stories. Um, but I have heard about him, I mean, these executive orders where he's stopping people from, from being prosecuted because they're his people, and ministers can stop people in their ministries from being prosecuted. Money going to I don't know where. I mean, I think uh, it was uh, said to be like $18 billion squandered. That's all the money the United States gave to Iraq. And that's what the Iraqi people say. They say, you know, $18 billion, where is it? Actually, I'd like to respond to that. Yes, um, it's true. I've, li I've only been going to Iraq for two and a half years. I've lived there permanently for 11 months. But the difference is, is I live with the Iraqi people. I have a staff who has suffered because of this war. I have a person living in the bureau cut off from his family in Anbar who cannot rent an apartment in Baghdad because he's a Sunni from Fallujah. And if that doesn't speak to the sectarian situation in Iraq, I don't know what does. Because somebody comes and tells you, I'm a nationalist, I want to be an Iraqi, the first sentence that comes out of something in somebody's mouth doesn't mean it's true. You have to talk to people. You have to hear what they say. There is a fear. People don't hate each other. I mean, Iraq, the tribes, they were intermarriages all the time pre-2003. The divorce rate among those is so high now. Because when you get married to a Sunni now, for example, you may be a Shia girl and you're going to marry a Sunni. Can that Sunni man come to your house? Can it come to visit your parents? Probably not. Can they come to your house? Probably not. I interviewed a woman who had to do a two-stop, um, like basically two stops to get home. Her husband would drop her off in one neighborhood where it was safe for him. Her brothers would pick, up, pick her up there because it was safe for Sunnis and Shias just in this spot. Take her to the house, drop her back. That man hadn't seen his, his father-in-law and mother-in-law in seven months since they'd been displaced. So, you know, I don't know who he watched on television, but I know that what I see and I know who I talk to, and that's where I get my information, the Iraqi people. Um, yeah, it is a good question. It's tribal name. It's, um, you know, if you're a Delaney, pretty much 
your Sunni, if you're Janabi, it's a Sunni tribe, um, the way you speak, um, you know, the, the southern dialect, the Shia southern dialect, you know, you might go up to a, a uh, Mahdi army checkpoint, for example, and if you say Mawlai, which is my master, and they answer, um, uh, they're referring to the Imams, you know, that's something that says you're very, very Shia. You know, the, there's a term that's actually um, the Shias use amongst themselves. Um, for it's, it's the word is shrugi basically, which is not it's not a great term for them, but it's something they they sort of own among themselves. Like I'm from the south, yes, I'm from the villages of the south. You know, I'm Shia, I'm poor, I'm from these little villages, and this is how I talk. So that's sort of how they indicate. I mean, they're both Arab. You can't look at somebody and say, oh, that person is definitely Sunni. I'm I'm not sure if I. The first question was he was he off topic talking about corruption. Uh, yes. Well, no. I mean, the Iraqi government is is known for the corruption. I mean, uh, 190,000 weapons. You can't even. You don't know where they are. You don't. You don't know where this oil is going. The congressional hearing yesterday was talking about uh, oil money going into the pockets of Shia and Sunni militias, the most dangerous elements in Iraq. I don't. I don't think that the ambassador um, was off topic at all to to look into this and to try to deal with this. Um, the sovereignty issue is also something that is interesting and the Iraqi people always ask them, is this a government? That's what they tell themselves. They ask themselves, how can we have a government that has to live behind a wall, protect themselves from us, and then when something like this happens where a foreign private security company working with a foreign nation uh, does something which they call cold-blooded mur murder, that's what the prime minister called it. They can't do anything. I mean, I think it says a lot about, about sovereignty and whether they have it. Well, I think uh, when you listen to uh, Ambassador Crocker and General Petraeus, they, they painted a, a rosy, I guess, a rosy picture of what, of what their mission here has been. You know, they didn't really, I mean, Crocker brushed a bit on, on the frustrations, but they didn't talk about the fact that this government was falling apart. They didn't really talk about the continued sectarian problems, militia problems, those types of things that first day. Um, instead, they used Enbar. Enbar wasn't even a part of the surge strategy. Enbar was a spontaneous, you know, a spontaneous movement that started in September 2006, pre-surge, all of that happened because people were tired I think uh, up in Enbar but it is also something something that wasn't part of benchmarks wasn't part of any of our our pre-plans so I had someone tell me once um, about six months ago before she was fleeing the country in Iraq that there were n there was no room for moderates anymore in Iraq she said uh, you know I can't question uh, she lived in a Sunni neighborhood said I can't question these Sunni extremists with covering their face. I can't ask them, who are you and why are you in my neighborhood? Because if I do that, they don't protect me from the Shias, the Shia militias that will attack us. And I think at some point, people will say enough is enough, but those lines, I don't know if there will ever be reintegration. Um, part of the surge, or you know, what they call the surge strategy was to build these blast walls. These blast walls have hardened sectarian lines. You put a wall around a Sunni neighborhood. I talked to a Mahdi army commander who told me, thank you very much for the Adamiya wall. Now I know who's coming in and out of the neighborhood and who's Sunni so I can pick them off. That's what he told me. And so I don't think, I mean, the Mahdi army, for example, there are Shias who do not like them, who are turning on them. But that fear is so intense and it goes to the core because you know you can be killed. You can lose your family. And, and it turns into hate because you no longer integrate. You know that they might kill you. They hate you just for one thing. Either way, on each side, and so the the human uh, the human factor of the other is is gone, and that's that's also a situation with the war in general for the American soldiers and the Iraqi people. You know, I I wish I had that answer for you. I mean, I wish I could tell you. You know, this is exactly what the Iraqi people and the Iraqi government are going to have to do once the Americans leave if they leave. Um, it's a, they're going through something now. Um, they, uh, they have a, a lot of people really don't have confidence in their, in their government. They see it as a, as a government of exiles, of people who didn't live in Saddam's time, came back and somehow became prime minister and president and vice president. Um, that was something that the uh, victory, the, Ira the soccer victory, the Asia Cup victory, did for Iraq that the government could not do. It was the only time, I would say, in Iraq that I felt people united as Iraqis. It was the first time, I would say. Because it's very, very clear when you talk to somebody 
who they are. You know, this is a Kurd, this is a Shia Arab, this is a Sunni Arab. But during that time, they were Iraqis wearing T-shirts that said, I am Iraqi. There were cell phone messages saying, get our government out and put that soccer team in the, in the green zone. You know, that's, that's what people wanted. The word secure, I, 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 just, I guess I don't really understand the word secure, to be honest, um, because does secure mean that you leave Baghdad the way it is now, which is um, she, it's, it's basically a series of borders and boundaries. People um, feel that they can't go from their neighborhood to most neighborhoods in Baghdad. And so does, is that secure? Or is it secure when people feel they can roam throughout Baghdad? Is it secure when sectarian violence has dropped to a level that's livable. I, I just don't understand the military's, um, I guess, measure. Is it, is it just about numbers or is it to, to put Baghdad back in a place where you can go all across Baghdad as a Shia, Sunni, Kurd? You know, if you can't move across Baghdad as, as an Iraqi who's from Baghdad, imagine being an American who speaks broken Arabic with a Lebanese accent trying to you know drive around Baghdad it's, it's very scary and I'm, and I'm scared all the time when I when I drive around I do it because luckily people don't look at me and say look there's a foreigner I have I look very much like an Iraqi woman and, and that's and that's helpful and we go out as families looking like families and we we go out with protection that as much protection as we can well it's you know not all women cover their hair in Iraq um, that's something actually very new. Um, Iraqi women had uh, had the choice to cover or not to cover under Saddam Hussein. Now nobody wants to be noticed, so they don't dress. If you have money, you don't dress up. If you if you don't cover your hair, you cover your hair in the street anyways because you don't want anybody to look at you and say, "Oh, who's that? Is she Sunni or is she Shia or does she? You know, is there a reason to kill this person or steal from this person?" So, yeah, I try to do whatever the women in the street do. If they're covering their hair, I cover my hair. If they're if this is a religious area, of course, I cover out of respect. If I'm speaking to a religious man, I cover out of respect. But um, I do whatever the women do so that nobody looks at me differently than they would look at anybody else. Um, well, I, I'm not sure. I, I think your question was that how do how do Iraqis view the split in America? Um, to be honest, I think when you talk to the Iraqi politicians, um, they look at it as something that's hurtful. They say, you know, the fact that you're fighting, the fact that you're saying bring bring the troops home, that's just emboldening our enemy, our, the terrorists, that type of thing. That's what that's what the Iraqi people say. The Iraqi people. I don't know if they have have the time to say to look into themselves and say, you know, some of these people agree with this war and some of these people don't agree with this war. Not everybody's like this. I think there's a there's a point in a person where they can no longer think about, well, it's just this one person, just like the Sunni Shia situation. And and it's something that happens on both the American soldier side and the Iraqi side. I've talked to American soldiers who see all Iraqis as enemies and doesn't understand, like one Marine to, told me he didn't understand why he had to come to Iraq to train these people when he was supposed to come to kill these people. Now this is one man, this is one young 19 year old guy who, who's misinformed and probably a little bit um, ignorant of the situation. But you have that on the Iraqi side too, who sees every American as a, as a soldier in a Humvee who's coming up his street and occupying his country, you know, that's the, that's, that's the um, vernacular. But among the educated, most of which have fled the country, I think people do see that this has become really domestically awful for the United States. It's something that has become a, a political, it's part of a campaign now, and, and Iraqis know that. They know that a lot of what's happening in their country has nothing to do with them and has mostly to do with who's going to be in office next. Well, I think they're, they come in contact all the time. I mean, their, their newspapers are full of translated stories from the Washington Post, from AFP, from AP. You know, they come, Jazeera quotes uh, Western media all the time. They watch movies. I mean, they, there's a, there was a great story that uh, one of my staffers was telling me. She's a, she's a 47-year-old single mom, and there was a search in her house by American soldiers. And she's a covered woman, and has perfect, perfect English. And she's standing at the door and they walk right past her like she doesn't exist. And they look at their bookshelf and they see John Grisham. They're like, you read this? And she says, yeah. And she starts speaking in her perfect British accent. And he's like, oh, wow. And suddenly there's a conversation. This is a human being. And, and then uh, she, they say, do you have a weapon? And of course, every Iraqi household does. And she says, yes, it's up in the cupboard. And uh, 
they find her son, 13-year-old son's Grand Theft Auto and, and other video games. And they're looking at Khadun and, and he says, is this the first house you've searched? And uh, they say, no. He said, well, all my friends have this game. And so really they're very exposed to Western culture. And I think they really understand the debate going on in the United States. They understand that this is not easy for every American to deal with and, and to see their, their, um, their soldiers die. And I think the people, of course, killing the U.S. soldiers understand that too. Well, mostly I'm based in Baghdad, but I, I try to move around as much as I can throughout the country. Most of the places in Iraq now are off limits to me without embedding mili with the military. Um, you know, I do try to go to some of the southern cities. Of course, I don't do it often. I do it uh, very rarely, and, and each time we decide whether or not it's a, it's a safe decision. Um, so I try to get out as much as, it, as we can, but we also have Iraqi stringers throughout the country. So if something happens up in Suleimania, in Kurdistan, I have an, an, a Kurdish reporter, Iraqi reporter, who will help us with our coverage out there. Um, the other thing I think he, you were asking about was the children, and I think that is a, a good question because these children now, if you think about it, a four-year-old in Iraq knows nothing but the Iraq war. And so you see that children's first words are sometimes bullet, or you, you know that kids can learn how to, the, a friend of mine that told me that her daughter one time was staying at home, she didn't talk yet, but she knew how to make the shape of a gun with her thumb and index finger and say ta-ta, like the sound of a bullet. Um, children, uh, there was one uh, young man that we talked to in Saidiya whose school was raided by Iraqi commandos who are known to be infiltrated by Shia militias looking for uh, Sunni Arabs and so he's taking a test and they come in and he sees them start to detain people and he's not detained he's a Shia Arab and uh, the last question on his test he couldn't answer and instead he wrote help me and, and this is we talked to him after and so I think it's really psychologically damaging for children and for young people who can make it to school and then those who can't make it to school and depending on how long this war lasts in 10 or 15 years that's going to be a real economic problem. Um, first, I don't think I ever talked about the American military being bad or uh, I didn't advocate any type of pullout. I think you're um, assuming a lot of things from what I say. What I'm telling you is what I hear and that's my job. My job is to listen and to tell you what I hear and what people tell me. And um, the one thing I did say was that the American military is actually among the, in the Iraqi eyes, no longer the biggest enemy. enemy. They're afraid of each other. And um, the elections, yes, people went out and they were so proud and they held up their purple fingers and it was something that brought goosebumps to so many people's arms. And, and now, you know, I talk to a lot of Iraqi people who say, where did my vote go? I know that one Iraqi politician talked to me about Sistani, who somebody brought up as a, actually, which I would like to get back to is, of course, he's a religious figure and in Islam, homosexuality is not considered okay just as it's not in Catholicism and a lot of these religions so it's not surprising that somebody comes out with a, a fatwa like that. Um, Sistani brought concerns that the people were coming to him and he supported the the uh, ruling party now the United Iraqi Alliance um, or the coalition saying why did you tell us to vote for these people? Why? They didn't do anything for me and so I think sometimes people look at the messenger of what what I'm telling you is not my opinion. What I'm telling you is what I hear, and, that, and that's my job. It was a pleasure.